Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. All right, well, our uh, listener support campaign continues. You can become one of our Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Our focus today is on one-time donations. So you can send in a one-time donation via PayPal to support.greatdetectives.net by using the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net or by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 837 one five. And if you do send along a donation of twenty dollars or more, I'll happily send you one of my uh, ebooks that we have uh, listed available on the site, including Slime Incorporated, my first detective novel, and All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo, or uh, its sequel, All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet. With a donation of one hundred twenty-five dollars or more, we'll happily send you a uh, physical copy of one of uh, Radio Spirit's Harry Nile sets. Uh, uh, We'll send that with a donation of $125 or more. However, we'll happily send you the download for only $75 or more. The full list of available items is at support.greatdetectives.net. However you choose to donate, just please uh, let us know what you'd like. Now, before we go ahead and get into today's episode of Rocky Jordan, I did have a personal update, which is that uh, our uh, family has changed. Our cat passed away at the age of 14, and we now have a uh, year and a half old dog named Rocky, who's just an incredible Border Collie mix. He has got a ton of energy, which is very common for that breed. Uh, and uh, just just a great, great dog. Uh, really blessed to get him. Uh, one thing I will let listeners know right away, let you guys know, is that uh, I actually did not name him. He came with that name. So he, as far as I know, he wasn't named after either Rocky Jordan or another uh, detective we've had on this uh, podcast, Rocky uh, Fortune. But uh, let's go ahead and we'll get into today's episode of Rocky Jordan now. The original air date is April the 30th of 1950. And the title is The Mystery of Carl Kleist. Sunday is a big day on CBS. Jack Benny and Bergen and McCarthy, Rocky Jordan and R. Miss Brooks, The Whistler and Red Skelton. Yes, for varied entertainment, Sunday is a big day on CBS. Now, Del Monte Foods brings you a world of adventure with... Rocky Jordan. His name was Carl Kleist, K-L-E-I-S-T. For the past three years, I'd see him around Carl. I'd nod to him, he'd nod back. And that was the sum total of our relationship. 120 pounds of insignificant little guy. I thought, how wrong can you be? Carl Kleist turned out to be dynamite with a short fuse that figured to explode my face. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Yes, Del Monte, the best-like brand of canned fruits and vegetables in the whole wide world, takes you now to the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Mystery of Carl Kleist. started when the sound of the burglar alarm cut into the quiet night air. It wasn't my alarm. It came from down the street, the Bon Voyage Tourist Agency, run by the brothers Willie and Carl Kleist. You know how it is when you hear a burglar alarm go off. 
You listen, look, say, somebody's burglar alarm, and let it go with that. I probably would have done the same. But as I looked down the street to where the sound was coming from, I heard another sound. Someone inside the tourist agency was throwing heavy objects through the front plate window. I figured I'd better get down and take a look. When I got there, a small crowd had already gathered. Someone is inside. I was passing by. The window began to break. I heard someone calling me. All right, let's go in. The door is locked, sir. I have to hide. Then we go in through the window. After we widen it, watch out. I'll use my foot. Yeah, that'll do it. Come on. He's sir. How may we stop the alarm, sir? Don't worry, I'll get it. That's why I'll do it. Hey, Sandy, over here. I have found him. Look, sir. Willie Kleist. He has been nice. So I see. Willie. Uh, Willie. Willie, it's Jordan, the tambourine, down the street. He is still alive. How is it possible for him to be alive with such a large knife in him? Ah, shut up. I'm truly amazed. Tell Carl. Tell Carl. They have come. Who has come, Willie? Who knifed you? They have come. Zell. Zell. Tell Carl to hide. Zell. What has happened, sir? Has he died? Yeah. I knew it would be so. He could not live with such a large knife in him. You better stick around, Smiley. There are going to be some questions. I'll call the police. Well, the cash box is still full. Obviously, robbery did not enter into the killing of Willie Kleiss in the slightest. Oh, I didn't think so, Sam. Not after what Willie said. Yes, of course. Well, the killer was not seen by anyone. Huh? Apparently, he left by the back door. Leaving Willie for dead. But Willie was still alive and threw some ashtrays through the window to attract attention. You know what I think, Sam? Hmm? I think whoever did Willie in didn't come for Willie. Or at least didn't come for Willie alone. He came for Carl, too. Jordan, what do you know of his brother, Carl? Oh, not much. They ran this tourist agency together. Moved in a few years ago. They're Austrian. Carl's a little guy. Quiet. Always got a book under his arm. Seems completely lost in thought. Mm. Well, I will see if I can locate him. He undoubtedly will be able to shed a great deal of light on this affair. If you can find him. If he's still alive, I'll bet he's in hiding. From Zell? From Zell. Jordan, are you sure Willie Kleist gave you no description of this uh, Zell? Nothing which would make my task of locating him easier? No, nothing, Sam. Well, it does not seem I have much to go on. Now, keep me informed, will you? I'm going to be interested in seeing how you work this out. So I went to work, and I went back to the tambourine, putting the affair of the murder of Willie Kleist in the back of my mind. But it didn't stay there long. The next day, about three in the afternoon, I had a visitor. Tall and thin in her early thirties. You could tell she was a traveler, not a tourist. Mr. Jordan? Yes. I was wondering if I could speak to you for a moment. You can. My name is Ilza Altman. I travel for the Continental Hotel chain. I happen to be in Cairo on my way to Algiers. And I read in the paper this morning of the death of Willie Kleist. I see. Uh, the paper said that you were the one who... who discovered the... Uh, well, anyway, that is why I am here. Uh, this is the Willie Kleist who has a brother named Charles. Yes, Carl? Miss Altman. Carl, that's the one. I, I see. Well, Mr. Jordan, can you tell me where I might find this Carl? I'm sorry, I don't know. The police are looking for him, too. Captain Sabaya, the paper said. He is in charge. Yes, you might go see him. If anyone would know where Carl Kleist is, if he isn't dead, Sabaya would. Is there a possibility Carl, too, might be dead? You should know anything's possible. Why are you so interested in Carl? Uh, a personal matter. Ah, uh, it always is. You know him well? I did know him well. At one time, we were going to be married. Oh, I see. Now, our plans were changed, as plans like these often are. I would like to see him again, however. Tell me something, Miss Altman. Did you ever hear Carl mention anyone named Zell? Z-E-L-L? -L? Anyone? No, I do not believe so. Are you sure? Well, it is hard to be sure. After all, I have not seen Carl in some time, and I do not remember everything he said to me. You better go see Captain Sabaya. You can probably help each other. I'll phone him and tell him you're on your way. Uh -huh. 
I gave her the address of Central Police Headquarters and walked her to the front door. She thanked me and was on her way, walking south from the tambourine. That's when I noticed the guy in the white linen suit. He was tailing Ilsa Altman, and it didn't look right. On the corner, she caught a cab, and Big Boy went for a cab of his own. I went for him and got there just as he was opening the back door. I stepped in close to keep him from moving into the cab. Hey, you got a match, mister? What? A match? I need a light. Get out of the way. It's not fair tailing Ilsa Altman. She may already have a boyfriend. But do you work for Zell? I said, get out of the way. His big hand reached up and grabbed me by the coat. I started to swing, but I was pressed up close to the cab and couldn't get up much power. Besides, he was faster, and a hairy right caught me in the face. It had a lot of steam and shook me up. Before I could recover, he grabbed my shoulders and threw me to the sidewalk. Taxi, follow that cab. Hurry. By the time I picked myself up, Gorilla and his cab were off in a cloud of carbon monoxide in hot pursuit of Ilsa Altman. But I wasn't unhappy. I figured I'd slowed him up long enough for her to get away. When I get back to my office, the phone... Yeah, uh, Jordan speaking. Jordan, this is Sam Sabayo. Oh, I'm just going to call you, Sam. That was a girl... Jordan, I am called to issue you instructions. Instructions? You are to disengage yourself from any concern with the Geister firm. What? What I say is quite clear. I don't get it. What's up? Nothing you need know, Jordan. Just heed my word. You are to have nothing to do with the affair. As a matter of fact, you might do well to forget the murder of Willie Kleist and even act as though you have never heard of a man named Carl Kleist. That is all, Jordan. Goodbye. Why, Sam? What's all this mystery about Carl Kleist? Jordan, it is impossible for me to answer that question because it is impossible for you to ask it. Remember, you have never even heard of a man named Carl Kleist. Goodbye, Jordan. Sam. Jordan. This is not what you think it is. Heed my warning or there should be trouble. Well, it had turned into something important. That was easy to see. I mulled it over for a while, thinking about Ilsa Altman, the big guy tagging her, but most of all about Zell and who he was. The next day, I fell a little deeper into the Carl Kleist case. I was walking down the Sharia El Mumar on my way to the barber when I heard a voice. It was Yusef, an Egyptian shoeshine boy who worked the streets around the tambourine. A little guy who seemed to know as much about people as the secret police. I have seen him, Jordan Bay. I have seen him. Who have you seen? The man you are looking for. Who, Zell? No, the other one, Carl Kleist. I know where he is. Come, Jordan Bay, come. And with that, he turned and bolted down the street. I moved after him, jostled a lady carrying a load of vegetables, excused myself, and kept right on going after the scurrying Yusef. He led me up a couple of back streets and stopped in front of an old rat-eaten rooming house run by a German named Brombarger. Inside, Yusef took me down a dark, smelly hall to a door marked six. Inside, Jordan B. Inside. Carl Christ is inside. I opened the door with caution, stepped into the room. Who's there? Cowering in the corner was 120 pounds of nervous man, Carl Christ, and he held a gun. Go away. Go away. Carl, it's me, Jordan. Go away. Carl, the police are looking for you. They'll give you protection. Now, come on with me. He started to empty the gun in my direction. Yusuf and I hit the floor. The bullets cut into the wall, and then I moved for Carl fast, but he was wild with fear. He threw the empty gun at me and picked up a chair and began to whack me with it. So there was nothing for me to do but plant one right on his jaw. Just took an easy one to lay him out cold. Then I stood over him to bring him to. I opened his shirt. The first thing I saw tattooed on his chest was a four-letter word. Z-E-L-L. Zell. There it was again, and as big a mystery as ever. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Ask most men to name their favorite foods, and I think you'll find that corn, sweet, butter-tender, golden corn, rates right up there near the steak and potatoes. And if you want to give the men at your house corn just exactly the way they think it should be, give them Del Monte Golden Whole Kernel Corn for sure. Yes, Larry, it makes a lot of difference which brand of corn you buy. It's a product you can really compare and tell the difference. So many women are finding Del Monte corn outstanding on every count. It's wonderfully sweet, with a high natural sugar content that's grown right in. Yet it's rich in hearty summer flavor, too. 
Not only that, but it's remarkably tender. Those plump, milky Del Monte corn kernels are so very thin-skinned, they all but melt in your mouth. You'll agree you've hit a new high in corn enjoyment the day you try Del Monte corn. I appreciate its dependable quality, too. But then I guess everybody knows you can't beat any Del Monte product for that. Why not enjoy delicious Del Monte vacuum-packed golden whole kernel corn tomorrow? Remember, it's thrifty, too. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Mystery of Carl Kleist. It had all started with the murder of Willie Kleist and the disappearance of his terror-stricken brother Carl. Mixed in someplace were Carl's former fiancée, Ilsa Altman, and a big guy in a white linen suit. Then a little shoeshine boy found Carl Kleist and led me to him. In the scuffle that followed, Carl got laid out, and when I opened his shirt, the tattooing on his chest said Zell. The same word Willie had uttered just before he died. Zell, whoever he was, was the crux to the entire mystery. Well, I sent Yusef to find a phone to call Sam and bent over Carl to bring him to. That's when Brombarger, the German who ran the rooming house, stepped into the room. What is happening? I heard shooting. Oh, what is the matter, my car? Nothing. Some cold water won't fix. Here, help me get him on the bed. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Here. Yeah. On the bed now. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I tapped him a little harder than I realized. There's the water now, huh? Hmm. What is this on Carl's chest? Dead? Does it mean anything to you? Huh? Peculiar anyone should tattoo. Such a thing on a chest? I get the button now. Hey, just a minute. Who is Zell? Oh, Zell is not somebody. Huh? Zell is a place. Lake Zell. Zell is a lake in Austria. I have been there once or twice. Hmm. Oh, now I get the button. So it wasn't a who, it was a what. Zell wasn't a person, but a place. Lake Zell. But even that didn't mean anything to me. Why should a place be so important? Why should its mention be feared? Why should it be one of the last words Willie Kleist uttered? While Brombarger poured some water and then proceeded to bring Carl to, these questions ran through my mind. Well, maybe Sabaya would have the answer. He'd be there soon enough. But as it turned out, somebody beat him to it. Well, Mr. Jordan, you were not able to help me before, but you certainly have helped me now. Ilsa Altman, and she held a thirty-two. Standing alongside of her were two friends, a couple of muscular white turban Bedouin tribesmen with knives in their belts. Uh, Mr. Brombarger, I suggest you turn around and face the wall and remain that way until we leave. It will be safer for you. Yeah, 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 I do that. Omar, you might do well to stand by Mr. Brombarger with the knife to the neck so he does not call out. As you wish, madam. Looks like I made a mistake, Miss Altman. You're on the wrong side. Yes, Mr. Jordan, you did. But don't feel too badly about it. We all make mistakes one time or another. Carl, are you all right? Yes, yes, I am all right. Oh, that is fine, Carl. You appear to be somewhat uh, shaken. Did Mr. Jordan injure you when he hit you? I am all right. Then, shall we go? She said she was once your fiancé, Carl. You pick rough women. No, she, she was not my fiancé. Uh huh. Well, if you'd have given me a little more time, Miss Altman, I'd have probably figured it out. I'd have remembered you didn't crack when I said the police and I thought Zell was a person. If you've been around, you'd be sure to know it was a lake in Austria. What's it mean? Mr. Jordan, why do you not realize that the less you know of this affair, the more secure your life is? Uh, turn to the wall, too, like the good Mr. Brombarger, and in a moment, Carl Kleist and I will leave, and you need never let the thought of either of us cross your mind again. Oh, you won't get far. I sent a shoeshine boy out to phone Captain Sabaya some time ago. The police are probably outside now. Mm, not likely, Mr. Jordan. The boy did not reach a telephone. But do not worry, Mr. Jordan. He will not be injured. Neither will you or the nice, quiet Mr. Brombarger. All we want is Carl. Now come, Carl. We really must be going. Uh, 
Dorian, I told you distinctly upon the telephone that you were to disengage yourself completely from the Kleist affair. Sam, I'm telling you, I didn't have any choice. When Yosef told you he knew where Karl Kleist was, you should not have gone with him. You should have come and said to me. There wasn't time. Yosef was off like a streak. I had all I could do to follow him, let alone get in touch with you. Oh, well, yes, yes. I suppose you had no other course. You will have to excuse my manner. It is that I am quite upset about the fact that Miss Altman now has Carl. What's it all about, Sam? What's the big mystery? What's this Zell business? The Zell business. Come with me into the other room, Jordan. There's someone there I think you might as well now meet. Mr. White Linen Suit? Yes, Mr. White Linen Suit. Jordan, this is Mr. Frank Sunday of the American Federal Bureau of Investigation. Oh. Looks like I got in the way of the wrong person. Yes, I'm afraid you did, Mr. Jordan. I guess it's my day for making mistakes. I'm sorry. Well, that's nice, but it's not enough. You sure fouled the works. Because of you, Ilsa Altman escaped me. She's a smart woman, Jordan, and a vicious one. She had Willie Kleiss killed, and it's a good bet she'll do the same to Carl. Why? Why? Because of Lake Zell in Austria and what it means. Um, sit down, Jordan. You might as well know. Story goes like this. In early 1945, when Allied troops were surging into Germany, there was a group of German scientists and aeronautical engineers working in a hideaway in the Bavarian Alps. They were at work on a project called INSEAN, a highly secretive and a highly important project. INSEAN was a pilotless plane that could rise 40,000 feet a minute. It carried a 1,000-pound warhead, which exploded on contact. An extremely advanced type of weapon. Oh, I'm still listening. Uh, Twenty such planes were constructed, but by then it was quite apparent to the Germans that the war was lost. And a special courier arrived at the Bavarian hideaway with orders from Hitler. The Enzians were to be destroyed. And all the blueprints of the project, plus all information of an advanced nature, were to be put into airtight steel cases and dropped into the waters of Lake Zell in Austria. And so the story goes, Jordan. If it is true, we must know the information of an advanced nature inside those cases. And Carl Kleist can tell. Yes. He was one of the high-wrecking aeronautical engineers working on the projects. His identification was that tattoo on his chest. Well, that clears up a lot of things. Ilsa Altman's still fighting the last war. Oh, the next one, Jordan. She and whoever she's working for. They don't want us to get Carl Kleist because of what he might tell. Now she has him. Can we get him back before he's killed, Jordan? It sounded like an invitation to help. But whether it was or not didn't matter. They were going to get my help anyway. I'd played it like a first-class sucker. I didn't like the taste it left in my mouth. Sabaya got out of call, of course, and his men started looking for Ilsa Altman and her Bedouins. I left headquarters and began to tap some sources of my own. Camel drivers who knew the desert trails and the desert hideaways. Had any of them seen an encampment of Bedouins with a European lady? Uh, most of them hadn't. But a wise and old character named Shalik had seen some Bedouins. Not one encampment, but three. At any of these encampments had he seen the European woman? No. So Shalik and I rented a jeep and went out to look over the three encampments. Number one, seven or eight kilometers beyond the Bulak Bridge, turned out to be a dud. So did number two, some old ruins of Ramesses the second or third. Number three was a deserted oasis at the bottom of a valley. Oh, we had better stop upon the rise here, Effendi, so we will not be seen. Oh, yeah, okay. There, there, below is the encampment. One, two, three horses. One of them must have four ply. What, Effendi? Four ply, Shalik. Those are tire tracks down there going into that growth. Yes, so they are, Effendi. Well, this could be it. I'm going down and find out. Shalik, there's a big date farm a couple of kilometers back. Drive down and phone Sabaya. Tell him where I am. And tell him I'd like to see him very much with a half a dozen or so of his best men. Just in case. Well, I moved carefully through the sand, keeping in the shadows of the dunes. It was slow going. Sand was loose. and I didn't want to start a slide for fear one of the Bedouins would see it and wonder about the movement. Slowly, I inched my way closer. The object being to get near enough to the encampment to get a look at the faces of the Bedouins sitting cross-legged outside of a tent. It was Humar's face, the face of Ilsa Altman's number one boy I wanted to see. Then I'd know and it'd beat it back up the rise and wait for Sam. 
Oh, and I saw it all right. He was one of the three men sitting there. But as I saw him, he saw me. He yelled at his men. I turned and ran up the rise. But it was rough going, my feet sinking ankle deep in the sand. They had it much easier. Umar and his men came after me on horses. I kept on going, but they got closer. In a moment, they were on me. Umar. Umar leaned down from the saddle, raised a heavy fist, and threw it with all his might into the back of my neck. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. If you'd like to make your salads, first courses, or desserts as bright and colorful as a May basket of spring flowers, you should get acquainted with Del Monte Fruit Cocktail. It's a regular bouquet of color and flavor in itself. I should say so, Larry. Del Monte Fruit Cocktail adds so much glamour to a meal. And it's easy, too. Yes, Del Monte Fruit Cocktail is good-looking, good-eating, and a real time and work saver besides... You get luscious peaches, mellow pears, and tart sweet tropical pineapple, ready cut and mixed with juicy seedless grapes and scarlet cherry halves. Just think, you don't have to select the fruits, pare them, cut them, or do any of the work yourself. And why should you? When you can get such a sparkling fruit combination ready prepared and perfectly balanced for flavor, you'll be proud to serve Del Monte fruit cocktail on any occasion. Actually, that's one reason why I keep it handy all the time. So I'll always be prepared for last-minute company to dinner. It's menu help you should have in your kitchen day in and day out. Stock up with Del Monte Fruit Cocktail next time you shop. Now, back to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. I woke up sometime later inside the tent with a large-sized headache. Umar was there carrying a silly grin. Ilsa Altman was there, too, with a gun and a holster. And so was Carl Kleist. Mr. Jordan, why? Why do you insist upon placing me in a position where I must make difficult decisions? I guess I'm just nasty that way. Everything was so simple. Carl and I had a long talk, did we not, Carl? Yeah, we had a long talk. We discussed what was important to Carl. He did not wish to die insignificantly on his death up. He decided he would leave Egypt with me and return to our friends of long ago and continue in the field of aerodynamics to do important work for the future. Did you not decide so, Carl? Yes, Elsa. You are most convincing in our talk. There, Mr. Jordan. Carl and I were to leave Egypt quietly, with no further bloodshed. And now you have upset everything. You have come to disturb the tranquility. What must I do with you? Oh, stop it. You're going to make me cry. Oh, well. Quick decision. Umar? Good. Kill him. Umar drew his knife and moved toward me. The silly look in his face grew larger and his eyes sparkled. He was in for some fun, he thought. Four steps were all he took. Uh, Not so convinced, Carl Kleist yanked Ilsa's revolver out of her holster and turned it on whom? Give me that gun! I will not go back! Carl! Why did you do that? Why? You... You had better take the gun, Mr. Jordan. Other two Bedouins may come in. More coffee, Jordan? Oh, no thanks, Sam. I've had my fill. Well, I will have a little more. Well, the affair of Carl Kleiss is at last at its end. Mr. Santi will take him to the United States in the morning. And Elsa and Humar made them all. Mm, killed in a moment of desperation by a man who too long kept secret knowledge he should have told. Jordan, something has just struck me. <clears throat> What's that, Sam? 
Do you realize that we do not know the real ending of the Kleist affair? We do not know if the story of the steel case is the bottom of Lake Zell is true or not. Uh, I guess we don't. I guess we won't. Uh. Well, I suppose we do not have to know everything. If the story is not true, if there is not information of a, an advanced nature of aeronautics at the bottom of Lake Zell, most of this has been for naught. And if there is? Then I'm quite sure your American government will be able to get it from Carl Kleist. And all of this has not been for naught. And you'd like to know which is true for sure. <laughs> well, Jordan, you cannot blame me for being curious. Hmm. What do you got there? Uh, a coin, Jordan. Um, observe. Heads, it is true. Tails, it is false. Heads or tails? Uh, well, what what could a coin tell? Hmm. More coffee, Jordan? Heads or tails, Sam? <laughs> Neither. It fell in a crack and is standing on its side. <laughs> For superb flavor, for dependable quality always, enjoy Del Monte fruits and vegetables. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. The brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jay Novello as Sam Sabaya, and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell, with original music composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is Horde of the Memlukes. Anytime you're thirsty, pour yourself a tall, sparkling glass of golden Del Monte pineapple juice. There's real refreshment for you, rich in the tropical, tart sweet flavor of full ripe pineapples. Make yours Del Monte pineapple juice next time. Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Well, a fun ending and a good story that plays into a lot of uh, modern uh, or then modern concerns about the post-war world and uh, a slight hint at the Cold War without getting too much into that. All right. Well, listener comments and feedback. And we have a new review in the Apple podcast store. Uh, and this one, uh, comes from the Australian store and head, uh, headbag, uh, wrote, I've subscribed to this podcast for several years and now my partner started listening too. We listen almost every night as we go to bed. The consistency of the format and the quality of shows are amazing and comforting. I particularly like Rocky Jordan, especially for the portrayal of Sam Sabaya. It's unusual in old-time radio shows to have a non-white character portrayed so well and as a sensible person and not an irrational stereotype. Uh, Captain Sabai is, is a much better uh, police officer than all non-main character police officers in other shows, per, uh, certainly better than Inspector Faraday. We bought T-shirts t- and wish Adam and Andrea all the best with their adoption uh, process. All the best, Hedvig. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate uh, the comment, Hedvig. And Sabai is certainly a unique character. Now, I will say from my research that there is some controversy debate over how to racially uh, categorize modern Egyptians. So probably the easiest uh, way to talk about this is in reference to ethnicity as opposed to race. I think there are a combination of three things that really uh, do make Sabaya stand out. Uh, first of all is that he is the main 
supporting character. You can find uh, on a lot of old-time radio programs uh, some uh, characters who are of a different ethnicity, but they are real people and uh, do have worthwhile thoughts, but usually they are guest characters uh, or just other sort of one-shot characters. Uh, Sabaya is on nearly every week. The second thing is that he's not a stereotype at all. And come to think of it, I don't think Greco is either. Uh, and if there is a reason for that, it may be just that in the States we don't have a ton of stereotypes, or actually I, I doubt we have any uh, stereotypes about Egyptians that everybody would get. But at any rate, it, it does give... Uh, it does give Sabaya something where the actor is not playing him super broadly. And the other is that he is someone who is actually an authority uh, figure. In fact, in uh, I would say most, if not all, but m most of the episodes, Sabaya is the highest ranking voice of actual authority uh, to appear in the episode. Now, there are lots of old-time radio characters who meet one of these requirements, and maybe two, like I think of Captain LaSalle from uh, Bold Venture, uh, who still, uh, he, he is, you know, a recurring character and the voice of authority, but he's a bit of a stereotype. Uh, but you get into Rocky Jordan with Sam Sabaya, and you've got a very unique uh, character. And, of course, what it really does take is good writing and Jay Novello's characterization to make for one of the most remarkable supporting characters in old-time radio. All right, well, I do want to remind you that our listener support campaign is continuing. If you donate $100 or more through our uh, one-time uh, giving options, I'll happily send you Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt. Just be sure and let me know your size, the color, and the style of t-shirt. doesn't apply for the pullovers, but uh, do let me know, and at $100 or more, I'll be happy to send you one. Full list of available items for one-time donation at support.greatdetectives.net. All right, I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to thank Harold. Harold has been one of our Patreon supporters since September 2017, currently supporting us at the Master Detective level of $15 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Harold. And uh, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Boston Blackie. And we'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Rocky Jordan. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.